I was so nervous before I came up here, so I was drinking a bunch of water. Now I gotta pee, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's hot in here. It's just sweat. It's just sweat. <laughs> okay. So yes, I'm, my name is Jody. I'm from East Los Angeles, California, from the United States of America. I'm of Mexicano descent. So all of my Latino, Hispanico, Latino, Raza in the back, orale, you hear them? You got, it, it. he's an adopted Mexican brother, that's Chris, it is. <laughs> you know, I, I, did, I did have um, a prophetic word over, over some in this room, and if I could just have have you close your eyes just for a second. I just really felt that in this room today, there was just a, a, a feeling in some of inadequacy and unqualification. And I'm not speaking about disqualification. I'm talking about unqualification where there's just been this spirit of I am not qualified, a spirit of I am inadequate. And I just want to remind you in this room, if you have said yes to Jesus Christ, that you are a son or a daughter of the Most High, and that it is Christ who qualifies you. It is Christ who has adopted you into this very significant, amazing family of God. And stop looking to man for approval. And stop looking to be um, looked at by man for, for, with affection and adoration. God sees you this morning. And he loves you. And you are worthy. You are qualified. And if that was you this morning, just receive that word. And I, I hope to hear of all the amazing things that you do. Amen and amen. You guys can open your eyes if you're still closed. Um, I, I am passionate about the Great Commission. How many of you are still passionate about the Great Commission? The so Great Commission is a co-mission. We are on mission with Christ. It's a co-mission. And one of those passions that, that works out in, in, in the life of our ministry and one thing that I am passionate about is bringing through the next generation. And when I talk about the next generation, I'm, I'm not just speaking about young people, but I am speaking about this next generation of believers. The, these, these next people who are, who, who are coming to Christ through the life of our church. And I think it's, it's important for us to give this our focus. Ty spoke about why we struggle to, to disciple in the church today. And so I, I hope to just add on to some of the things that he said um, one of our values in our togetherness is there is no generation gaps. That we don't believe that there is, there is a small God for, for, for young people or a mini Holy Spirit for, um, for our children. And I'm telling you, if you are youth workers or children's ministry workers, you should take the responsibility seriously. And I think we're in a day and age today that we can't just throw our kids in a room and give them pizza and show them a movie and think that that is adequate bringing through of the next generation. That we have to give them the time and the focus and the energy and the resources to bring them through just like many of us were brought through. It's amazing to me how the world's picture of the next generation has started to creep into the church where we think the next generation is less than or we think the newer models they're not as good as the older models and all you guys who like cars you know what I'm talking about oh they just don't build them like they used to so that's the builder's fault and so if it's the builder's fault if this next generation isn't what they used to be, then it's the disciples' fault. And obviously we can't take, we know discipleship is a two-way process and I'll speak a bit about that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But I just want us to just, just turn to Deuteronomy chapter seven if, if you have your Bibles today. 
Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 9, I'll read. And this is God's heart for the next generations and this generation. It says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all people on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations, say a thousand generations, a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And so the Lord is gonna be faithful to this next generation just like he was faithful to us, but this thing of the great commission is to teach the next generation all that the Lord had commanded them. All that the Lord has commanded us. And this thing of this blessings of the generations flowing through the generations, we have a huge responsibility, church. We have a huge responsibility to invest in this next generation. How many of you believe that? And if you do, say amen. amen. I think one of the reasons why we struggle to, to invest in the next generation or even why we're struggling with, with discipleship is because we are so obsessed with church growth. I mean, honestly, we are obsessed with church growth. How do we grow our church? But I'm telling you, if you and I walk out the Great Commission today to go, first and foremost, preach the gospel, number two, and make disciples, number three, church growth will handle, will, will handle itself. Do we believe that? Do we believe that God's pattern of the kingdom growing and advancing was settled with the Great Commission? We're reading all these church help books and all these things that we consider to, church, to grow the church. I want us to consider this portion of scripture. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 14. You should all have your Bibles. This is an equip. For all of you young people, let me show you what it one looks like. It's... Take it. I love the way Bible smells. It's just whew, something. So listen to this. This is, this is probably going to be, a, um, I don't know how I read this. Just, just follow along. Consider this. Now when one of those who, it's uh, Luke 14, verse 15. Now one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things. He said to him, blessed is he who shall eat the bread of the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at a supper time, at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I asked, I ask you, I ask you, to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Husbands, stop using your wife as an excuse. Verse 21, so that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house began to get angry and said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here, the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind and the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded. And still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. So we know this is a parable of the great feast. How many of you know this parable? And so this great feast was put out, this great feast and what's amazing to me is when the invitation was given and there was no response, do we realize that the Lord of the house who set out this great feast did nothing to change the menu? He didn't clear the table and say, oh, no, this, uh, it's got to be the food. It's got to be the presentation. 
So let's change the food and let's reinvite those people in hope that they come. And I think what's happened is we've been so obsessed with church growth that what we've done is we've cleared the great feast that God has for the people that are to come into the kingdom. And we've set out a dessert table. You guys know these things, right? They have the cookies and the cakes and the M&Ms and help me Jesus. So this dessert table's there. And so these people are so attracted to the dessert table. And it was never what God intended for them to come and feast on. But it's what we presented. And so they've come to the table and they're excited and they're eating the cookies and they're eating the cakes and they're eating all these things that we've set out. And then we start to realize this isn't healthy for them. They can't just keep eating this stuff. We got to change the menu. I mean, have you ever tried to take a cookie away from a kid? It's like trying to take a burrito from a Mexican. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's, it, it's, it's like trying to take a taco from an Aussie. I'm telling you right now. Yeah. We had the Aussies out for our Rise Up Youth Conference earlier in the year, and they had tacos every night. And it didn't, it didn't help that there's a taco guy like cooking right on the corner of the church. It's, it's, it's rough. So what we try to do is then we try to switch up the menu and we say, okay, no more cookies, no more cakes. We're going to put a healthy portion of spinach on the table. And then what do those who have come to the table expect? I'm not eating that. That's too healthy. That's not the diet that I'm used to. And I'm telling you, if we are going to bring through this next generation, we can't change the pattern that Christ has given us. And we can't just get so used to this attractional model. We can't start dummying down what the church looks like because this next generation isn't going to get it. Jesus invested his life into 12 young men. He didn't empty out the synagogues. He didn't go get the, the most educated. They were uneducated men. And if we know anything about Jewish culture, most theologians think that they were anywhere from the ages of 14 to 21 years old. So if we think about that, three and a half years of ministry, they were released into apostolic ministry from the ages of 17 to 21, or 24. What are we waiting for? Jesus has invited us to this amazing feast. And that feast is available to this next generation. And we got to clear the cookies and we got to clear all the treats and we got to start giving them the things that are healthy. In your churches today, I hope that you are giving them a healthy portion of Jesus. I hope that you aren't playing it down. I hope that, that the, the reason why these kids are, are, are looking desperately to other things that we see happening with other church movements or whatever it is, is because they're longing for more. We need to offer it. Are you with me? I'm just going to go through a, a few points here. Um, I, I call it uh, it's seven keys to bringing through the next generation. First and foremost, we need to give them a focus. And that focus is Jesus Christ. But just in, in, in anything like discipling, discipling isn't just talking at them. It is showing them. And if we don't have a focus on Jesus, then they're never going to have a focus on Jesus. And excuse this, this verbiage, because I know people really do suffer from ADD. But I'm telling you, we are so ADD with our spiritual focus on Jesus. It's like, oh, Jesus, oh, great, oh, church growth. Oh, Jesus, oh, church growth. I mean, we are just, we just, we just if you've seen the Ice Age, and I think it's just, just oh, that one little rat thing. It's, I mean, that's how we are in the church. And we wonder why our kids aren't focused. And we wonder why they have their phones out during so service and they're looking at things. We need to give them a focus, a focus on the king. I love, I love um, um, Leo spoke about behold. That was John the Baptist's declaration when Jesus stepped on the scene. Behold the Lamb of God. And that word behold, if any of you have ever served in the military, it's like saying, attention on deck. And what happens? Everyone rises to their feet and they pop in attention because they are giving attention 
to the king of glory. We've got to give them a focus. The next thing we need to show them is a fear of God. A healthy fear of God. I mean, I, I, I've, been in, I've been in rooms where, of ministry where, where, where God has begun to do things. And I've just seen young people who have been a part of different streams who just think like Jesus and the Holy Spirit are their, are their buddy. Laying on the ground and, oh, Jesus is here. Well, then you better get on your face or lock up in the position of attention. And I'm not, I'm not discounting the authentic, but honestly, we need to teach our young people a healthy fear of God. But we need to demonstrate it. And, and these things need to be taking place in the lives of our churches because if not, they're gonna go look for somewhere else to find it because their hearts are desperate for it. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And we want the next generation to shape up quickly, right? We want the next generation to come along quickly and, and why don't they get it? You teach them the fear of God and they'll begin to walk in, in wisdom that will far exceed our own. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Teach and demonstrate biblical adoration for his presence. This next generation is so hungry for the Holy Spirit. Let's model it like we have a healthy fear of God, amen? The next one is fight. We need to teach this next generation how to fight. First Timothy 6, 12, Paul encourages his spiritual son to fight the good fight of faith. We need to teach this genera next generation how to take a punch spiritually. It's amazing to me how many young Christians just get taken out. How many offenses are being brought in the life of the church for like silly things that are taking place and people are walking away from the bride of Christ because they are offended. Someone didn't say hello to them. Where does this come from? How offended are we walking around? Are they catching what we have? They, they need to learn how to fight. We see in 1 Timothy 1.18, this, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage good warfare. When's the last time you prophesied over the young people in the life of your church? So that they can wage warfare with those prophetic words. Parents, when's the last time we prophesied over our own children? Our babies. It was amazing to me. Sometimes being a pastor, I have no clue what's going on in the life of my church. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But you know, the toddler ministry, we just don't know what's going on sometimes because we're not in there. And our baby, she's in there. But the other day, she was on the table and she began to evangelize to her brother Judah. And so she stands on the table and she says, Judah, Judah, Jesus died. And he rose again. And he's in my heart. She's two. So someone in our church is doing something awesome. <laughs> and she's catching it at two. We need to teach them how to fight, amen? The next one is faithfulness. We need to teach this next generation to be faithful. But, but listen up. If we need to teach them to be faithful, we need to model faithfulness, church. We need to model faithfulness. Faithfulness to God, faithfulness to his church, Faithfulness to spiritual disciplines. When's the last time you fasted with your young people? We fasted with our kids, and I'm telling you, man, one of my sons, he took it seriously. He was just like, I'm going no food, no water. I'm all in. We're like, well, come on, buddy, you can have some water. I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> Faithful in service. Faithful in giving. Teach your children to give to God. 
I'm telling you, you teach them now, when they get older, they're not going to struggle with it. They're not going to have the baggage that we have of calculating numbers and, oh, well, the groceries and the car payment in the house. And they're going to just, it's God's, it's not mine. Teach them now. The value of fruitfulness. You see, faithfulness is one thing, but how many of us know that faithfulness produces fruitfulness? And if faithfulness doesn't produce fruitfulness, then we have, like Tyron spoke about yesterday, mules who cannot reproduce. Fruitfulness has to be something that we show them. This is, should be fruit. There should be fruit of your life. That is a sign of a good disciple follower of Christ is fruitfulness. Fruit of our life mat- matters. Number, number six is fellowship. It's amazing to me how the church or the church, Leo talked about the, the greatest church that doesn't attend church in America. The largest church in America is the traveling church. They just visit whatever church is exciting that morning. Fellowship is so important. And I'm telling you, if we aren't modeling it for this next generation, they're never going to catch it. If we aren't plugged in, it's not a Sunday morning thing. We see in Acts 2 where the church came together daily. They ate at tables. They met in the synagogues. They met on the streets. They did life together. And discipleship happens along the way. It's not a program. There's no 12-step process to being a disciple of Jesus because if there was, I would have signed up. And we love the programs, but this is a lifestyle and fellowship is part of it. And listen, fellowship brings family and family brings ownership. In our family, everyone has to own it. If there's a mess, we're all cleaning it. The kids don't like it, but that's what's happening. Same with the family of God. We all own this together. Partnership. The last one I have here is is freedom. We need to create space for this next generation. There needs to be an abundance of grace that we just lavish this next generation. And I'm not talking about licentiousness. I'm speaking about us creating space, taking healthy risks. You remember the risks that someone took on you? Those are the risks that we need to be taking on others. We can't set the bar so high that we don't even qualify. I'm telling you, churches need to be planted by men in their 20s and women. Can you think about where they'll be when they're in their 60s? 40 years experience. Releasing. Don't create a space that doesn't allow this next generation to be free. This morning, if if you're from the ages of 25 and younger, I would love to have you just stand. Is it still morning this afternoon? I know some of you really want to stand up right now, but please don't. Yeah. And this is, this is relevant, but just hear my heart. If you've, if you've accepted Jesus into your heart, Within the last three years, it's not a magic number. I just figured Jesus took about three years to walk his guys before they were released into their everything. But if you've accepted Jesus within the last three years, please stand. Even if you're over 25. Amen. Awesome. Let's look around. This is our next generation. We need to commit our resources, our love, our everything to this next generation. That's what Jesus did. He laid down his life for his friends. And those 12 men, I like to say it the other way around, they turned the world right side up. 
just extend your hands to these, to these amazing charges for Jesus Christ. Lord, I just pray for this next generation. Lord, we, we don't stand in the gap. Lord, we stand next to them. And Lord, we say that you prepare an amazing future for them. Lord, I pray that their faith, their energy, their excitement will be contagious for us, Lord. Lord, we, may we never see them as less than. May, may we never see them as a weaker model. Bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks.